Real-Time Strategy, a genre coined in the early 1990s by Westwood Studios co-founder and game producer Brett Sperry. Though not the first of its ilk, in 1992, Dune 2 solidified most of the conventions that games like Command & Conquer, Warcraft, and Starcraft would iterate on for decades to come. Constructing buildings, hiring infantry vehicles and aircraft to capture vital resources, and thwarting dangerous enemies are staples of the genre. All viewed from an overhead perspective with Fog of War, careful planning and scouting are necessary to ensure you have the intel to succeed. This became a trend during the golden age of gaming, where developers invented new and brilliant concepts practically every year. All of this was thanks to the lightning-fast advancement of technology during the 90s. The internet boomed in popularity, which rapidly redefined how the world communicated, worked, and played. Those days usually required games to use a direct connection or a local network. So it's no surprise that these two ideas, the RTS and online connectivity, would intertwine. Services like GameSpy and QuakeWorld pioneered the future of gaming, with some of the first online matchmaking ever launched, but were clumsy and unreliable by today's standards. By the middle of the decade, some veterans from Origin Systems, including Ken Demarest, best known for their work on the Ultima and Wing Commander series, formed Titanic Entertainment for their debut game. This would become the first major real-time strategy game designed exclusively for online multiplayer, where you could meet up, chat, and battle with other players around the world without ever leaving the core game. This is par for the course now, but was unheard of in 1997. With a background in role-playing games, the team at Titanic crafted the rich and vibrant world of Nimbus, a universe where skyborne islands conquer one another with advanced technology powered by the four elements of the storm. It captivated those lucky enough to experience the game. And so the premise for a game with sky-high ambitions was born. Netstorm, Islands at War. That storm was ahead of its time. StarCraft's competitive multiplayer scene was years away, and strategy games still focused on story-based single-player campaigns, with the occasional local network match. The internet was in its infancy. Titanic knew going online only was a big gamble, so they developed a short set of single-player missions. Netstorm flips the expected strategy game tropes on their head. You begin each battle with one or more islands and a priest under your control your most vital unit. He can both gather resources and build structures like altars and workshops, which let you research more powerful technology. But if he dies, it's game over. You can also hire golems to aid him in collecting storm crystals, which are harvested from geysers scattered across the skies. This is your primary currency to spend on buildings, units, and upgrades. You achieve victory when you damage and stun enemy priests, capture them, and bring them to your altar for sacrifice, ending their reign. And here comes the first twist to the standard RTS formula, the puzzle-like bridge and platform mechanics. Much of the gameplay revolves around planning and creating bridges between islands and storm geysers. Up to six tiles at a time spawn into your building menu, with varying lengths and layouts. Placing bridges effectively and rapidly is the most crucial skill to hone in the game. Bridge tiles spawn cracked but become stronger if you let them sit for a short time before placing them. This deters building bridges too rapidly. Unconnected bridges are unstable and crumble over time. It's a little like playing with Legos or Tetris, where you must swiftly piece together a shifting set of tiles to reach distant locations. You also get a lot of open ends, which can connect to floating buildings like power generators, turrets, or other structures. Next comes the unique energy system. There are three furies, wind, rain, and thunder. These produce three unique energies. Sun energy is universal and is derived from either of these three. Your temples and power generators allow you to build new structures within their radius of effect. All structures require an energy source to build, with potent ones often requiring two or more sources. 
Sun energy powers your earlier weapons and defenses, such as sun barricades, which are impenetrable to projectile fire. Sun cannons can shoot up, down, left, or right, but not diagonally. And for short range, cheap, omnidirectional attacks, sun disk throwers are handy in a pinch. Wind energy powers airships and speed oriented units. The versatile crossbow fires in a 60 degree arc. Devil Makers summon whirlwinds to engage units from the skies. Wind also powers the fastest ground transport in the game, Sail Skaters. Rain Energy powers self-healing ice towers, one of the few structures in the game that will resurrect itself, and acid barricades that vaporize any enemies that cross their threshold. Rain also hosts an arsenal of deadly weaponry, like the rapid-firing ice cannons and vampiric mana wars. Flying units whose lifespan increases with each kill, Thunder powers the most aggressive fortifications, such as the powerful Thunder Cannon, which fires extreme damage in a singular direction. Enemies between two or more Arc Spires get electrocuted, and Vander Towers destroy flying units within their radius of effect. And the third major spin in the genre comes from its unique combat. Unlike most RTSs, Netstorm laser focuses on fortifying your base, rather than ordering units to attack. Here, all combat units are structures, either automated turrets or hangars that spawn temporary units to attack within their range of influence. In a way, it's almost like the great-grandfather of what we now know as the tower defense game. Unlike most strategy games which have many similar, mobile units with varying levels of ability, Netstorm was like an abstract board game in its tactics. Most combat units are immobile or only affect a specific radius. Like the Rook in chess, Cannons have a long range, but can only shoot in direct 90 degree angles. Some units can only fire in a single direction, while others have a narrow cone of effect. All units follow the rule of concentrated power. The wider the effect, the weaker it is. The more narrow or specific the effect, the more powerful it is. The disposable sun disk thrower can outperform the much more powerful thunder cannon in some situations, despite being a quarter of the cost but head-on would get decimated. There are also many methods of defense, such as the obvious stone towers, which serve effectively as punching bags, or the more advanced tactics of creating barricades of acid, sun power, or arcs of lightning, which require careful planning to line them up for maximum effectiveness. The memorable soundtrack will sound familiar to fans of another title released in 1997, Fallout. Mark Morgan composed both games, and they share some similar riffs and melodies, with moody atmospherics and crackling storm sound effects here and there. The inspired architecture and world design of Nimbus stand out even more due to everything in the game having an encyclopedia entry, with intriguing lore behind them. This imaginative world stood out in my memory over time, and every few years I'd go back, reinstall, and check out what I was missing in the skies of Netstorm. The mechanics and fascinating world building made Netstorm soar, but there were some darker clouds looming beyond the silver lining. For starters, it was revealed years later that the single player campaign was an afterthought. Netstorm was intended to be multiplayer only, and it shows. Beyond a nicely rendered cutscene or two, most of the campaign is just fighting, with a couple brief text prompts here and there. The world was interesting, but the story was underwhelming especially when compared to the historical epics of Age of Empires, or the full motion video cutscenes of the Command and Conquer series. Netstorm's storyline just didn't carry much weight or drama. There is some clever mission design here and there. One mission pits you fighting back to back with an ally. In another, you must break free from the bridges constricting your expansion. The three campaigns and a handful of tutorial maps were relatively short and only last as long as they do because of their incredibly punishing difficulty at times, which required high skill levels and lightning fast bridge manipulation to succeed. Part puzzle game, part real-time strategy combat. In a fascinating world with online connectivity, there was really no other game quite like Netstorm. And considering the hundreds of RTS games we've gotten over the decades, that's saying a lot. Though a small but dedicated community formed around the game over time, an active player base was an absolute necessity for the game to see success. Unfortunately for Netstorm and its developer, it was too little, too late.
internet connections in 1997 were extremely limited compared to anything today. Most consumers dialed up to internet service providers using modems and phone lines. The more advanced DSL hardware and connections were rare and expensive, and back then, cable modems were just a twinkle in the eye of their developers. Game director Ken Demarest had previously worked with Richard Garriott on an early prototype of Ultima Online, one of the most popular MMOs ever made. But these kinds of games would constantly struggle with the primitive internet connections available at the time. Despite this, the online portion of NetStorm was fascinating. In almost an MMO-like presentation, you could explore multiple spheres and watch as your own island flies around and meets up with other islands and rings to prepare for battle. You could delve further down into other spheres for more competitive play or to battle with AI opponents. Each sphere acted as a chat lobby too. So at its prime, the game offered plenty of tools for players to meet up and duke it out online. Also ahead of its time for an online game that isn't an RPG, there was a progression system. You would unlock new tech tree options when you captured and sacrificed enemy priests. This was progression paid in human blood, and it was rewarding to get a hold of new gadgets and strategies as you succeeded in matches, but also served as another disadvantage for newer players. And for a game with such a high skill ceiling as Netstorm, the climb could be very daunting. Netstorm's focus on online play limited its consumer base, I, along with many others, only found out about the game through its popular downloadable demo, but a few problems emerged around this. For one, the demo was actually a locked form of the full version of the game. Some users quickly cracked this, and during the rise of Wares, or pirated software, this no doubt hurt the sales of the game. Cheaters exploited Netstorm's vulnerabilities and bugs. You could nuke your enemies for a quick victory, or even grant yourself unlimited resources, provided you had the right cheating tools installed. This is par for the course for early online game development, but also dampened excitement for Netstorm's biggest selling point. The nail in the coffin, though, was that Netstorm released a mere month after one of the most celebrated RTS games of all time, Age of Empires by Ensemble Studios. Microsoft was pushing Empires as their flagship game for Windows 95, and its depth, combined with intuitive mechanics, would conquer the market over the coming years. Though well received by critics, Netstorm proved a disaster in sales. They sold less than 14,000 copies in the following three years, a fact that Activision's global brand manager remorsed. Though probably still the most advanced multiplayer internet strategy game released, Netstorm suffered from poor timing. It came out before internet gaming had really broken through, other than for Doom and Quake. This made it a difficult sell. Peter Karpis, Activision. Outshone by its more flashy and story-centric cousins like Warcraft and Age of Empires, Netstorm was further outshone when Starcraft dominated the genre in 1999. The skies would become emptier and emptier over the years, so Titanic Entertainment closed its official servers in 2002 after five years of dwindling player counts. Shortly after Netstorm went under, Titanic shuttered its doors as well, Former staff would later work on games like Deus Ex Invisible War and Thief Deadly Shadows. In a post-mortem with director Ken Demarest, he said that the game had loads of potential, but game updates weren't frequent enough to keep up with player feedback. In retrospect, he would have opted to release the game much earlier, in a beta of sorts, to clean out the bugs and balance the game for a more polished and tested product. Despite the game's short-lived battle for survival, Netstorm did eventually garner a dedicated audience, albeit a bit too small and too late to save it. I remember logging into community servers in the late 2000s and being met by friendly strangers eager to help a newbie like myself. I've played dozens, if not hundreds of multiplayer games over the years, and I've rarely seen such a welcoming community as I did in those later days of Netstorm. Unofficial patches and community-hosted servers went on for decades after the publisher and developer gave up on the game. As years went on, the desire for a return to Nimbus inspired several attempts at a remake or a sequel. There was an attempted StarCraft II mod which recreated the gameplay of Netstorm, and a fan sequel built in Unity called Netstorm II, which would evolve and rebrand several times. 
They attempted multiple crowdfunding campaigns and eventually released in Steam Early Access as Stratus Battle for the Sky. And by 2019, the dev completely rebuilt the prototype from Unity into an Unreal Engine 4 version. The future is uncertain for this indie successor, but the passion to recreate the ideas of Netstorm are demonstrably present. There is no foreseeable limit to game design other than budget and imagination. That's what makes this industry so beautiful. Here's hoping more developers and publishers continue to take chances on new and unproven ideas for all kinds of games. The sky is the limit. I hope you enjoyed my love letter and documentary of a cult classic game I hope never gets forgotten. If you enjoyed this content, please subscribe and consider supporting my work on Patreon. My deepest appreciation goes out to those spending their hard-earned dollars to help me pursue these projects. And thank you for watching. A win. Thunder. Oh, the storm. It is done.